So last time we're talking about uh, Kirchhoff's rules, we ended off with that. And so uh, Kirchhoff's rules involves two, two rules in a complex circuit. It's a, the first rule is the junction rule, and that involves uh, currents that is going through a, a particular junction or a particular uh, loop, as it were. But uh, in this figure here, I have the current I1 is going to get split into two different currents, I2 and I3. And the junction rule just states that the sum of I2 and I3 is going to equal to I1. And the sum of all those currents, if we add them all together, is going to equal to zero. And so our job in um, the Kirchhoff uh, loop circuits is to figure out what currents are going to make zero. In this case, since we know that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3, well, it follows that I1 minus I2 minus I3 are going to be equal to zero. Because solving this equation, we get this. And that's it's basically saying in a matter of terms, OK, the current that's going in is the current coming out. So I1 in is going to be equal to I1 out. So we're saving charge as we do that. That's basically your junction rule. And if I were to write this out, you know, just to kind of get more, more visual on it. The sum of the currents entering any junction must equal the sum of the currents leaving. Basically saying the same thing. I1 must be I1 at the end. I1 in equals I1 out. That's a junction rule for currents. And the loop rule works for voltages. And so the loop rule, two, I think we know potential difference means voltage. Sum of potential differences across all elements around any closed circuit loop must be zero. We're basically doing closed systems for currents and voltages. We're saving energy, as it were, saving charge and saving energy. Because currents are flow of charge per time, potential differences is the difference in uh, electric potential from you know, your positive terminal to your negative terminal. So sum of potential differences across all elements, and that's the sum of the voltages. So that all the voltage drops must uh, mm, add up to zero. So there's not going to be any change in the voltage for that particular loop for however, for, um, for however many loops that you have. And we've seen this. Uh, must be zero. Okay. So for one, some of the currents zero and two. The sum of all the voltages must be zero. And so our job is to figure out what currents make up zero and what voltages make up zero for the, uh, the loop rule. And so in, in any conventional current case, let's say that we have a resistor here and we have current I flowing through that resistor. This is A to B. If we're going from positive to negative, we're going to be losing energy to the resistor. 
So the potential difference will be VB minus VA is going to be negative IR. And, and that's the voltage across this resistor, which is the current times the resistance, which is Ohm's law. And that should make some sense to you because VB is going to be low potential. So zero minus whatever number is going to be negative. So you're losing energy across this resistor if you're going from positive to negative. And then vice versa, if you're going uh, from negative to positive, right, and you're going this way, you're going to be gaining energy. So delta V is going to be VB minus VA, where now A is negative and B is like six or nine or some number. So that's going to be positive. So far, so good. So this is current. And so those are the things that we're gonna to have to keep in mind um, when we choose any particular junction for the current to split or any particular loop that we want the voltage to go around. So we can choose the direction of the loops and the junctions to be any direction that we want. We just have to keep the signs consistent. It, you know, We don't have to loop one way and that's gonna be the only way to loop. So it's a, uh, it's your matter of your, your preference, you're still gonna get the same answers. Um, depending on uh, how you're gonna loop, loop around a circuit, uh, the current value, let's say, will be the same, but uh, depending on the loop, uh, the direction that you're looping, the current, uh, your the current might be positive or negative, but it'd be the same number. Okay, so let's go back to the two uh, example we saw last time. And then I will be giving you a complex circuit with two batteries. So the one example we saw, we'll go, uh, the one battery, um, Okay, and then we have this. So basically the pattern for the junctions and the loops, this is positive and negative, you know, that's your, your battery symbol. Here's resistor number one, four ohms. This one up here will be five, and this will be nine. I think I'll just put that in in the loop. Now this is important. Make sure you understand this part. I think we do, but I assume nothing. Okay. Now for conventional current, it's positive all the way to negative. So here is current, let's call him I1. We know at this point it's gonna be one junction. Uh, so this I1 is gonna split into two currents. We're gonna have I2 and I3. So that's our junction already. We only have one junction here and two splits. So that means we have three currents, one full current, two splits, and there's three total currents. And so it's gonna come out as I1 all the way back to the battery and on and on and on until the battery goes dead, all right? So that's our junction. Our junction is gonna be, we can make a situation, okay, as soon as this current comes here, I1, it's going to be comprised of I2 and I3. And then if you put these over here on the left-hand side, it's gonna add up to zero. So the current is all conserved. Well, basically the charges are conserved. Right? Those are the, the charges are the, the little bodies that make up the current in the first place. We have one junction. So, uh, so our current is gonna split uh, one time as before we come back to the battery. So one of these junctions, so uh, and in order to solve for, like we had did last time, in order to solve for these currents, okay, uh, 
we're going to have to determine how many equations we need uh, uh, for this problem. Um, so we have one junction equation, and you'll see now, uh, let's see how many uh, loops that we're going to have. Now, we have two loops. Make sure you see these. Okay, I'm going to draw the bottom loop in red. So the first, the, 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 the way to determine the loop, start from positive, go all the way to negative. Now, there's a bottom loop here, and then there's a top loop. We can have the current flowing like this. That's our bottom loop, which will be consisting of the battery. The voltage drop across four ohms, voltage drop across nine, and we've already included the battery, so that's it for the bottom loop. The top loop, because this is a, an enclosure, so that's a loop. You know, we can have the current, uh, you know, going either direction. So we can have the, uh, let's see if I can keep it in red. We can go like this for our top loop. If we choose this direction, the voltage drop across nine will be uh, positive because we're going from negative to positive here. And the voltage drop across the five will be negative because we're going from positive to negative we're going to lose energy so i1 is here this is i2 and this is i3 do you all see that uh yeah okay so that should be all have from the last example uh, last friday so Make sure we got that. Jeremy, you're good with that as well? Just confirming? Yeah. Okay. Now, next to the equations. Our job is to figure out the values of those currents. Um, and in, in order to figure out those currents, we have to get equations that, um, a system of equations that involves uh, the currents and the voltages. And from there, we can make substitutions for one voltage in terms of the other, and then we can uh, break it all down to solve for the currents. So we have one junction and we have two loops, our bottom loop. And the number of loops and junctions, junctions give us the number of equations. We have one junction, two loops, three equations. Okay, so it's a huge system of equations problem. Remember that for the loop rule, some of the voltages must be equal to zero. Our job now for the bottom loop, what voltages make up zero? Well, glad you asked. Okay. So we have the voltage from the battery uh, plus the voltage across the four ohm resistor and the voltage across the nine ohm resistor for the bottom loop. Now, of course, the bottom loop involves is, is involved in the bottom and the top loop, but it just depends on our orientation uh, for um, how the uh, voltage is going to drop across the nine ohm resistor in either loop. So the, the, um, the top loop will have a one type of voltage drop and the bottom loop will have another voltage drop across the nine ohm resistor. So this is going to be a negative drop and up, to, up top here in the top loop, it'll be a positive drop or gain of energy. We're going from negative to positive positive to negative because our orientation is always the battery. Negative here on this side, positive on that side, positive on that side, negative, positive, negative, and there we go. So the battery is a six volt battery, high potential. Let's start with the high potential. If we start at low potential, it would be negative six. Remember, we can have unconventional current, but conventional current, so six volts minus four 
And remember, remember voltage is current times resistance. We don't know what the current is across I, but we know the resistance is four um, I1. We're losing energy here. We're going from high to low. So we're losing it. That's why it's negative. Minus nine I3. All of those voltages will add up to zero. By the loop rule, or the, the bottom loop that we have. Okay, so those are our drops in energy. The, uh, high value of energy, and we're losing energy across the four and the nine, nine ohm resistor. Now for the top loop, same thing. Some of the voltages. We have a voltage across the five ohm resistor, the voltage across the nine ohm resistor, and those, uh, of course, will equal zero. All right, so now the voltage across the five ohm resistor up top, we're losing energy. So it's going to be negative five I2. And for the nine ohm resistor, we're going to be gaining it relative to our loop. Um, choice. Now we can loop it the other way. This will be positive five and this will be minus nine. You're still doing the same thing. Okay. It's all preference. You're going to be saving energy either way. Um, it's just that if you get three amps in current for one uh, direction that you chose and you chose the opposite, you get a negative three amps. Same number, uh, different sign. And to indicate the current is in quote reverse if it's minus. Negative five I two plus nine I three. Gaining energy. I three is at the bottom. Should have wrote that in blue or something. I three. Okay. Made it even messier. Anyway, I two and I three. So you get I two. <laughs> I2, I3, I1. So that's what we got. So now for those who are watching this for the first time, these guys have already done this problem, but so they're gonna do it again. So three equations, why is that? We have one loop, we have two loops at one junction. So three equations. First one, I1. I2 plus I3. Then we have the first loop, which is four I1 plus nine I3 equals six, six volts. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I do that is because the total voltage is going to be equal to the sum of those other voltages. Uh, so we have one loop that involves um, a, uh, that adds up to a total voltage of six, and the top loop is the one that just you know adds up to zero. Well, they both add up to zero overall. But what we can do is we can solve for I one and I three and and uh, you know these you can set, if we take these voltages and set them equal to six, whereas these two uh, voltages here we can set them equal to each other. So, so anytime you have a battery, you can have the battery just hanging out and then put all the other voltages on one on the other side of the equation. But for this one, we can just set the uh, uh, voltages equal. So this is going to be negative five. I2, I3 equals zero. So what we can do is we can solve equation three for I2 and substitute that back into equation one. So I'm gonna take uh, equation three, solve for I2, negative nine I3. 
So I2 is going to be equal to 1.8 I3. I'm just dividing 9 divided by 5, 1.8. So that's my expression for I2. Now, put the 2 into equation 1. I1 is 1.8 I3 plus I3 equals 2.8 I3. We have an expression for um, I1 now. We can put that into equation 2. We've used equation 3 to get an expression for one uh, of the currents. And we use equation 2. We substitute that back. We use I2, substitute that back into equation 1. And the last equation to deal with is equation two. Again, this is just using your system of equations uh, logic. It doesn't matter what order you choose. You don't have to go three to one to two, it just depends. All right, so this is four I1, I1 is 2.8, I3. I and I3 equals six. That's 11.2 I3 plus nine I3 equals six. 20.2 I3 equals six. I3 equals 0 0.29, 0 0.29 amps. Okay. So that's in the direction of conventional current from uh, positive to negative. You know, if we chose the loop the other way, then it would be negative 0.29. Then uh, substitute I3 into equation three. All right. Equation three, we had a negative five. Um, I two equals negative nine times 0.29 amps. And then I two just becomes, uh, okay, 2.61 divided by five, negative negatives positive. Point five twenty two amps, and then I one is just an easy case. I one is equal to I two plus I three, right? So point five two two plus point two nine equals point eighty. Five amps. All good? Yeah. All right. Yep. Cool, cool. All right, all right. Okay, here's a good, nice guys. All right, here's a good challenge. You're going to love this. Good. We have a circuit here that involves two batteries. Let's see. Mm. Okay, negative, positive. One ohm resistor here. Three ohms. Okay. Five. Three. Five ohm resistor, then a one ohm resistor. And we have our second battery.
And this resistor here will be eight ohms. One ohm, three ohms. It's a 12 volt battery. And this will be a four volt, positive, negative. Your task now is to figure out the currents. I1, I2, I3. You can choose your loops to be to be any direction. I let me let me just you know give it to you. <laughs> Let's have our first loop do this and our second loop to do that. Now, uh, with that, you're going to have to figure out the the directions of your currents. So, um, so um. Let's see, um, what you can do is you can have one current going this way, one going this way from the four because this conventional current is gonna loop this way. And this from the 12 is gonna loop up this way. It doesn't matter what you label them, but um, I'll go ahead and make this one I1, I2, and then this is gonna get split. So I1 and I2 is gonna come here to make I3. Do you all see that? So now I'll tell you right now, you're gonna have one, uh, one junction equation and two loop equations, because you clearly see we have two loops. So three equations total. So take about uh, 10 minutes to solve this guy out. So our next section is gonna involve resistor capacitor or RC circuits. So it's basically a circuit that consists of a capacitor and a resistor and a battery source. And in this particular circuit, I have a switch that, um, you know, I've connected A to uh, the rest of this circuit. So now the current is gonna flow all the way through to this capacitor. Remember capacitors hold charge. They don't, they don't uh, 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 allow current to flow through, they store charge, but, um, you know, charge is gonna get through and we gonna have a current proceeding through this resistor. So we're gonna see how current uh, functions in a resistor capacitor circuit as well as charge. So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna use uh, Kirchhoff's rules to derive equations for current and for charge. And so we know that uh, uh, say the derivative of current or uh, of respect to time is gonna give us current. And so then we can integrate if we so please to get the, uh, uh, get the charge in the circuit. So first things first, our job here in this resistor capacitor circuit where we're charging the capacitor is to start off with um, this one big loop, use Kirchhoff's rules to figure out the, um, we're gonna figure out the charge as, as a function of time. And then from that point, we're gonna take the derivative to get the current as a function of time. So let's get started with that. So section 28.4, RC circuits. Squeeze this in there. So first things first, we know that for this whole loop here, and come all the way down, you know, that the sum, of all those voltages are gonna equal zero by Kirchhoff's loop rule. We don't have any junctions to speak of, so we just one flow of charge and current and one loop for the voltage, uh, uh, voltage drops. So in our textbook, we have a symbol for voltage, this capital epsilon here. So it really stands for EMF, which is a fancy way of saying voltage, electromotive force, that's what 
voltage was commonly known as in the 1800s. Um, Ampere et al. They're coming up with uh, uh, designing the battery or uh, power source for, for circuits. Um, so they commonly called the voltage source your EMF. And, but it's the same as your voltage, you know, for all, all intents and purposes, uh, argue over the semantics here uh, at the moment, but that is your voltage source, EMF. So for this one loop rule, we have the battery, which is epsilon or E, minus the voltage drop across this capacitor. We know that capacitance is Q over delta V. So delta V is going to be Q over C. So, so this is going to be a voltage drop of Q over C minus I times R equals zero. Now, our task is to um, figure out charge as a function of time. So what we can do is uh, rearrange this equation first in terms of the total voltage, which is E. And you have uh, the total voltage equals the sum of these little voltages here, which will be Q over C plus I times R. And then next we can, we know at this point this current's flowing you know, here, okay? So at this point we can uh, rearrange this equation in terms of, of the current uh, that's flowing through the circuit before it hits the capacitor, if you, if you will. So E equals QC over IR, this is a total, total voltage equation. These two voltages equal the total. And so step three here, we can transform this in terms of current. By Ohm's law, current is voltage divided by resistance. Voltage or E is the same thing, you know, voltage over resistance equals E over RC, and that's just, so we're, we're transforming this voltage into a current expression. Um, so voltage divided by resistance time compa times capacitance will give us um, our current. Um, And we also know that um, current is just gonna be uh, the derivative of charge dq dt. So one thing I, I, I wanna keep in mind first, before we get to this step three, divide everything by R, that's what we did, R. And so, you know, this is gonna be, uh, in that case, so this will be Q over RC. But since um, Q over C is voltage, we're going to express that as E over R times R times C. Oops, I'm sorry about that. Can't read my own freaking writing. Okay, let me let me re reprise that. This is going to be Q. I think something was off on that. My bad on that. Okay, so divide both sides by R. So let's just go. Let me do the middleman here. So E over R equals Q over R C plus I. And I'll take it up here, E over R, Q over RC, and I, in terms of Q, is just DQ over DT. So next, um, in our pursuit to get an expression of charge as a function of time, 
if I can just deal with DQ, DT on one side and set that equal to um, E over R minus Q over RC. Common denominator, all that good stuff. I will now have dq dt equal to ce over rc or plain c both sides we get the same denominator and that's q over rc so far so good you guys following that let me know it's always speak up good so far yep all right so it's just simple math at this point. We are on pursuit in getting an expression of charge. Uh, charge is a function of time. And then from there, we can uh, take the derivative to get the current. So that's dq dt. Okay, so next, step six, dq dt. So, I will now have my negative Q minus CE, just rearranging the terms around here over RC. Just wanted to do it that way. It doesn't matter. I can say C minus Q, negative Q minus CE. Um, and so at this point, what I wanna, I wanna do is I wanna group all the Q terms together and on one side of the equation and the, and the other stuff on the remaining side of the equation. So. Step seven. Let's have DQ over Q minus CE. I'll leave the negative sign on the right-hand side. So that just becomes negative. So I'm just swapping these variables. Uh, that just becomes negative dt over rc. So I got my q, or q, q expressions all together, q's and something else on one side and the other stuff on the opposite side. So at this point, I'm ready to integrate both sides, uh, I wanna get an expression of Q as a function of T. So I have my T on the other side and then the Q here, and, and that's this Q, whatever this expression is gonna be, is, is uh, it's gonna be Q as a function of T equals stuff. So step eight, ready to integrate from zero to Q. And I'm doing this in terms of the capacitor because the capacitor is gonna go from no charge to some maximum charge in a certain amount of T. So this is DQ over U minus C epsilon of our voltage equals negative one over RC because these are constants. Integrate zero to T DT. Edward, you follow that again? Okay, I'm just saying because I don't think you've had calculus, but anyway, like we've done before in other calculus problems, you're gonna be integrating with respect to the variable that's changing, the dt or the dq. And so this RC, this, so I have a three ohm resistor or a, a four microfarad capacitor. You don't integrate those, those are constants. They come out of the integrand, you integrate the stuff that's changing, the stuff with the d in front of it. The, that's, yeah, I got it. Yeah, that's an indication that the that variable is changing. So, like I was using before, go back here. I was taking this form. I copy that. Let me expand. And I'm trying to copy this. Mm. 
see if this works. Okay, one second. Okay, so uh, an integral of this type is very similar to this form. Got a dx over a plus bx equals one over b log a plus bx. And from this integral table here, uh, we won't have just a regular log, we'll have a natural log, but it's uh, very similar to this type. So doing that. I have natural log Q minus C epsilon over negative C epsilon equals negative T over RC because the integral of DT is just T divided by RC. So now, um, Divide both sides by natural log. One over ln is E exponent. So let's see, this becomes negative Q minus C E equals negative E. to the okay before I do that I want to kind of middleman here really need to do that but I'm okay so right, oops negative Q minus C E over natural log and this CE here, before, before I do uh, complete this division, before I complete this, this is gonna be multiplied up top. So it's gonna be CET, the negative sign is there. So negative, uh, CET. over RC. Okay, so this natural log is still hanging out. And so I just multiplied the CE on the bottom. So now I divide everything by natural log, I'm gonna get negative Q minus C epsilon equals negative E, negative C epsilon T over RC. Then at the end of the day, uh, I'm gonna add this to both sides, switch my signs. I'm gonna have Q as a function of time equals negative E minus C E T over R C plus C epsilon. And then I'll factor out my CE, and that's going to be 1 minus E to the negative T over RC. And this is my charge as a function of time. Um, from all of that work up top. Uh, so again, at this point, um, yeah, going back, this comes out to be natural log of this expression which is equal to this. I don't want to you know, divide by natural log just yet. Step 10, I multiply both sides by CE. 
And so therefore I'm left with uh, negative Q minus CE. And then uh, one over natural log. So I, this natural log here cancels out and this will be one over natural log. The uh, inverse of a natural log is the exponent, exponential function, negative e to the negative CET over RC. And I just solve for Q, this algebra at this point. That is my expression. My charge is a function of time. Um, now to get the, uh, the current. Uh, capacitance is Q over delta V. Q is equal to C times delta V, or in this case, C epsilon. So that C epsilon becomes Q. So I can just say Q is a function of time equals Q times one minus E to the negative T over RC. And then when I take the derivative of that, so this is going to be Q and this is going to be um, Q times minus T over RC. So this is just a constant. This one, this, this guy is going to go away, but this, this can be, this can be expressed as a, a derivative of Q as a function of time, because we have a time expression here. So we can take a derivative of this part, but not this part. So this for current dq dt, this goes away, right? And we're left with um, Q over T E to the minus T over RC. And just keep in mind, we have a complex expression like this, exponential expression, and we're trying to take the derivative of, with respect to time. We basically are going to um, we're going to take out the RC here and um, leave the T as as, as part of the, the function. Well, let me look at this and explain that a little easier. Okay, okay, sorry for that. Um, so we have our expression here. So dq dt, the q goes away because there's no time term there. So we don't take a derivative with respect to that. So we're gonna take a derivative with respect to this last part. This becomes I, so let me erase this part. Uh, okay, Q to T. I wanna just wholesale erase this. dq dt becomes i and we have q over rc that's what i was trying to say before but i wasn't showing that and i want to just make sure that that's all um, held together there uh, so when we're taking a derivative of this exponential function with respect to time. The time doesn't come out of the expression, but uh, all of the variables that are not time, so this RC is gonna come out, but it's gonna come out um, as it is in this exponential. So it's gonna be one over RC underneath this Q. And since it's part of this negative exponential, it's gonna be negative, RC, negative one over RC, so negative Q, uh, 
uh, times negative one over RC. So we have negative we have negative Q over negative RC, which is just Q over RC. And then we leave negative T over RC. Um, again, that's just a rule of exponentials that, you know, I don't wanna waste time over, but uh, that's the, the long and short of it. So if we have like, uh, Oh, e to the negative bt over m. And we want to take this with respect to m. It's going to be negative b over m. Negative b over m times e to the negative bt over m. So everything that is not the variable being differentiated with respect to comes out of the exponential function. So t stays and everything else comes out. So one over RC, negative one over RC comes out. And that's why we did that. Um, all right, so that's my current. Then I can go and simplify Q over RC, Q to the minus T over RC. And then Q over RC, Q over C is just voltage. And that becomes E over R, E to the minus T. RC. So that's my current as a function of time. I got my charge as a function of time. I got my current as a function of time. Now I'm ready to do some, you know, special cases with, with that. Um, okay. So let's take a look at some plots of charge versus time and current versus time. for this um, RC circuit. Okay, so take a look at here. Plots of capacitor charge versus time. So what we're here we're trying to do here is look at how the charge varies, you know, how does it change over time? Um, so far, you know, we have Q of T equals CE, which is charge, one minus E to the negative T over RC. Now, the thing is, as T goes to infinity, so let's just choose Q versus T, right? Charge time. T goes to infinity, this guy becomes one minus E to the negative infinity over RC, which is, you know, um, in E to the negative infinity. So basically E to the negative infinity. Well, one over E to the negative infinity is zero. So as T goes to infinity, charge goes to CE, a maximum value, goes to an asymptote. So starts to trend to CE. And then obviously as T is equal to zero, e to the minus zero is just one. So it starts, starts off here. One minus one is zero, so it's no charge. And t goes to zero, so e to the minus zero over rc is just e to the zero. One over e to the zero is just one. One minus one, zero. So that's why we start off at zero. Now, as T goes to RC, we have a situation here. So let me just keep this graph on paper. So as T approaches RC, we have CE1 minus E to the 
negative RC over RC. So that's just e to the minus one. Uh, and then we do this. That's one over e. You know, you calculate that one over 2.718. Da -da 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 -da. That comes out to be uh, roughly 0.632 CE. So as T equals, we call it, as, as T goes to RC, we call that the time constant, which is equal, you know, we just call it a different, different variable, we call it tau for the, uh, the time constant. So as T goes to tau, we get uh, CE becoming like 60% uh, of the maximum. So let's say that tau is here. We got this little plot, 0.632. And so we can play around with the uh, different, different values as, you know, as um, we go to e to the minus two, uh, you know, you can, you can start playing around with that. So, uh, so we can, we can double this. So this is, this is, uh, as T goes to RC, and if we go double RC, we're basically E to the minus two. Why don't you do guys do that right now and, and tell me what you get one minus E to the minus two, which is equal to CE one minus uh, two over E. What is that equal? So we can just keep incrementing the time constant so we can plot more values on our uh, charge versus time chart graph here. Okay, so. Um, Let's plot one more value. So again, this time constant is like, this is basically saying when time equals tau, right? No matter what the RC values are, it could be three and four microfarads, three ohms or four microfarads or whatever this, this value is, it's always gonna be about 63% of the maximum. So this is your constant for any RC circuit. You know, when we're looking in terms of a, you know, uh, charge, uh, charge versus time. So uh, again, when T equals tau, it's always gonna be 63% of the max, the maximum charge. And now let's take a look at the current versus time graph. And we know that current versus time is voltage over resistance, e to the minus t over rc. But well, you already know uh, intrinsically that's going to be an exponential decay. It's going to die off as a function of time. As t goes to infinity, i goes to zero. And as t is equal to zero, let's just do that. You know, as T goes to infinity, this is gonna be one over E to the infinity, which trends to zero. And then as T goes to zero, this is gonna be E to the minus zero, one over E to the zero, And that's going to be equal to E over R. So it's going to start at E over R max and trend towards zero. So we have an exponential decay. So this is nice to see how the basic form of this graph, uh, what the basic form of this graph is going to look like. 
So there's T. And no, we have E over R. And it's going to trend down towards zero. Again, if the time constant is equal to RC, it's going to be RC for RC. And that's E to the minus one. And then E over R, or does that's just current, one over E. That's just about uh, 0 0.368. We'll just call it uh, I or maximum I. You know, whatever the uh, max value is, we just call it the initial value. That when time equals the time constant, which is equal, which is the same value as whatever resistor you have in the circuit, whatever capacitor you have, the current will also always be about 37% of the maximum current. So about one third, third-ish, let's say somewhere in there. And then, Have arbitrary tau right there. It's somewhere between zero and infinity. Right? So it's just an arbitrary plot. And then you can do increments of that time constant. You can uh, do multiples. And if you go uh, twice the time constant, uh, this is going to be about 0.135, <clears throat> you know, and so on. So it just gives you an idea of how the charge and the current are functioning in an RC circuit. As T goes to infinity, the charge is gonna build up to a maximum value. And that should gel with your understanding of a capacitor. It's always gonna be the same value as the battery. It's gonna reach a maximum point. You know, cause that charge is gonna be, uh, it's gonna grow up to not the same value as the voltage is what it's going to grow linearly with that voltage. Uh, but better yet, the voltage between the, the capacitor plates, the positive and negative capacitor plate, is going to be the same potential as the battery. And at that point, the charge will be, you know, as a, at a maximum. And we see that reflected in the graph of uh, charge versus time. It's going to reach a maximum. But the current across the resistor is going to uh, go to zero you know, as the uh, <clears throat> over time, as the, as the as the time uh, increases. So those are just uh, two forms. Uh, we're looking at the charge in a RC circuit and the current in an RC circuit, seeing how they rise and or decay. We've then taken uh, three separate cases for time. If time goes to infinity for the charge function, the charge reaches a maximum. You let the circuit run, the charge is gonna reach a 
CE or maximum charge value. Conversely, the current across the, resist the resistor is gonna decay. It's gonna to trend towards zero. And as T equals RC for the charge and the current case, for the charge case, as time equals the time constant, we're always gonna have 63% of the maximum charge and also we'll have about 37% of the maximum current. So one's gonna grow, get to 60%, 63% over time at its, at its RC or at its tau value for the charge. But for the current, it's gonna to decay to about one third of its maximum value in the same amount of time. Any questions, comments? Okay, so next, last, we're talking about the discharging a capacitor. We saw the picture before where we are charging the capacitor. Um, let's go back to a battery here. Right, so we're charging it here. The switch is thrown to uh, point A. And so we are con uh, fully connected to the battery. Current runs through uh, the circuit before charge is starting to build up on the capacitor and current uh, runs over the resistor. So when we discharge it, we're gonna take the switch and go to B. So we're basically disconnecting it from the battery. And let's see what happens to the charge and the current as a result. We'll make no assumptions first. Let's see, now that we don't have a battery to deal with, what happens? So let's see. Battery. And then node B. Last time, A, B is so a discharge capacitor, positive, negative, positive, negative, resistor. So now, fully discharged capacitor. There is no voltage to be considered. There's no EMF, so E uh, from the Kirchhoff rule, uh, the loop equation goes to zero. So then from our um, original equation, you know, we had this originally, since that goes to zero, to zero. QC minus IR or just the whole thing equals zero, the whole whole loop equals zero. So that's kind of redundant. So we don't have to consider that. So in our loop equation, we just have negative Q over C IR equals zero. Um, if now, <clears throat> same method as before, we want to uh, figure out uh, how our how our charge functions with time. We can implement uh, the same method. As for the charging capacitor. So let's substitute 
I for dQ dt. And a Q over C minus R dQ dt equals zero. We know current is the rate of change of charge So now let's put the DQ stuff on the left-hand side. And that becomes Q over C. Then let's get all the Qs together and everything else on the other side. So this becomes DQ over Q. We deal with this positive. So RC comes over here and DT comes up top. So this is gonna be negative DT over RC. You guys see that? Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. Good, good, good. And the capacitor is going to reach a maximum charge, dQ over Q. Negative one over RC. Again, constants come out of the integral. And then we just have zero to T. It's going to reach maximum in a certain amount of time. Really the same method. And then we have natural log situation. Uh, this is going to be uh, Q over say uh, large Q because our, our um, intervals are in, uh, intervals of zero to Q. So, one is gonna be a natural log of zero and another one's gonna be uh, Q divided by Q. So we get the sample expression. Equals negative T over RC. Because again, integral DT is just T. And then Let's uh, divide both sides by natural log. We have Q over Q. And this here, this big Q, it's the same thing as this. I've been mean, just making a difference between uh, the uh, integrand variable and maximum Q. Then um, this Q over Q is going to be equal to E to the negative T over RC. Q as a function of time is just going to be big Q E to the minus T over RC. And that's how our charge varies when our capacitor is discharging. Simple enough, huh? I'm gonna keep going on with this viewpoint. So I'm gonna differentiate Q with respect to time. I'll just have current as a function of time. Negative Q over RC because this one over this negative one over RC comes out. T just stays there because I'm differentiating that whole function with respect to time. That's just a rule okay, of you know differentiating exponentials. Again, I don't uh, bore you with the semantics of as why as that. Pick up any basic calculus book to refresh yourself or go over that. But this RC comes out, so e to the minus. T over RC. That's how current changes with time. Or the current as a function of time. So this negative sign basically means that the current is going in reverse that it was before. So going back to our, uh, our circuit here. So the current was going, you know, forward, you know, down, you know, positive, negative. Now it's going to go this way. 
go back. And so this is eventually going to run out. It's run out of charge. Why? Because the current gets here, it's going to split, come back. It's going to continue to keep losing, losing, losing. This is not going to reach a maximum at all. And you can even see it in the functions. It should be quite intuitive. This is going to decay. This is going to decay. So eventually, nothing. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. Yep. So if we were to just, you know, just arbitrarily graph this, not. Paying any attention to those time constants and all that for now, we have uh, Q versus T. So you know when T is equal to zero, it's just gonna be big Q up here, DK. And then likewise with current, uh, it's be negative Q over RC, because this, this zero, uh, one over e to the zero is just uh, just one. And so we have uh, negative q over rc, and that's going to decay as t goes to infinity because um, e to the negative infinity, one over e to the infinity is zero. So the whole thing just dies exponential decay. So form of e to the minus x. And that's it. So RC circuits work kind of funny, right? So we have these exponential functions in our current and charge uh, expressions. And that's what we got. Is what it is. Okay, I will see if there's any little bit else I want to say. Yeah, if you if you put your time constant in there, that'll just be. Then why don't you go ahead and do that as an exercise? And that'll be our last bit, and we're out. What is Q of T Yeah. So there's that. Okay, what did we get? You get the value for a charge as T goes to RC. So it's gonna be uh, Q times E to the minus one, one over E. So what is one over 2.718? So they're gonna be decaying at the same rate, as you can see. What's this value? Anybody? It's 0 0.368. Right, as I thought, because like we did the last one. Um, so both the charge and the current is gonna be decaying at the same rate. So uh, as T equals RC for both is going to be one third of its original value and then keep on decaying at the same rate pretty much and let it run all night, <laughs> measure the charge in the capacitor, you know, voltage across the capacitor and uh, current across the resistor is going to be basically zero.
Okay, very good. I just want to add this in here and we'll be out. It's T equals tau. Yeah, well, I just put it here to measure up in, okay. And then if I say, same thing. Very good. Okay, and...